Peace. Okay, welcome everybody to the annual awards luncheon for the WRSA 2021. This is our first time uh, that it's actually a ceremony, not a luncheon. Uh, and we're virtual by Zoom and this is being recorded. So uh, everybody can enjoy it again later. But um, let me introduce myself and I will be serving as the master of ceremonies for the whole entire session here. Uh, my name is Janet Colhase and I am the current 61st president of the WRSA. And one of the uh, lucky jobs is to uh, be this master of ceremonies at this uh, award ceremony. So you get to hear me a lot. Um, so I'm definitely gonna have fun with this. So uh, without further ado, let me uh, start going through it. Uh, I'll introduce everybody and then sometimes people will share their screens. But, oh, let me say one other thing first. Welcome to all of you who have uh, attended this virtual WRSA meeting. It is a, a real challenge to not meet in person. And I think a lot of us have already, you know, wish we could meet in person. But on the other hand, we can have people joining from around the world that might not have been able to come. So I think we should view this as a, a good opportunity for uh, communication. So uh, I guess without further ado, let me just say, Joanne, let's start. So I guess you can uh, do the next uh, slide. Okay, so the first thing we, we wanna talk about is that over the past year or so, we've lost uh, many important scholars in regional science. So I just wanna say a few words about each of them. Uh, the first uh, I wanna talk about is Borja Johansson. And uh, he is uh, was at, Jibs, I can never pronounce this, John Cooper International Business School, we all call it Jibs in Sweden. And he was a WRSA me member and uh, uh, was editor for the Annals of Regional Science, which is a journal I'm an editor of. And he served many years on our journal and we often looked at him to him for inspiration and guidance on how to do the journal. Um, he was president of the European Regional Science Association uh, from 2000 to 2003. And in 2013, he was awarded the URSA, a European Investment Bank Prize for his, his great contribution to regional scientists. So certainly we will all miss him. Um, and now the second person to, uh, to acknowledge is T.R. Lakshman uh, from Boston University. And uh, he uh, was, uh, did pioneering work in transportation planning and regional economic development um, and he worked for Alan Voorhees and Associates, and he joined the faculty of John Hopkins University earlier in his career, and then later he moved to Boston University. You see that's what his uh, statement says there. And he served as professor and chair in regional, uh, oh, sorry, professor and chair of the Department of Geography. And he was the founder of the Bureau of Transportation Statistics in the U.S. Department of Transportation. And how many of us get statistics from that? A lot of us do. Um, he, was, uh, he was also a presidential appointment and Senate confirmed director during the Clinton administration. So he will definitely be missed. Okay. And the third person is Sid Saltzman. He was a regional science pioneer uh, from Cornell University. And uh, he was a longtime member of the Department of City and Regional Planning at Cornell. And he was a co-author uh, with Walter Izard of the methods of interregional regional analysis. And you know, you can, we all consider that a landmark textbook and many students have been assigned to read chapters out of it. So he certainly was a founding father of our whole uh, study of regional science. So maybe can we just take like a 10 second, you know, uh, quiet pause just to, you know, make our thoughts to ourselves about these people and then I'll move on. Okay, I think uh, we're ready to go on to the next slide. So let me, uh, before the next slide starts, introduce who's gonna be talking about it. I think most of you know Jaywan Lim, who is the executive director of the Western Regional Science Association. And he's had the job, this is your third year if I have it right. And what a, a crazy time to be taking the reins of the association, okay? So last year, our Hawaii meeting got canceled at the very beginning of the COVID. This meeting was supposed to be in Palm Springs and we switched to, to virtual. So uh, Jaywan has not had anything normal 
I don't know if we can even say the return to normalcy, right? But anyway, we have been working together for the past a couple of years um, on the association and uh, I got to know him very well when we were going through some of the trauma of, of deciding to make the meetings change from this or that. So I would like to just introduce him as our illustrious executive director. So Jaywan, go on with your uh, discussion. Thank you, Janet. Uh, first of all, I'd like to thank everyone in this room and all the participants for our first ever virtual meeting. The number we had was much bigger than we initially thought, we initially planned. So in a sense, considering the situation is quite a successful meeting, thank you all to joining us, uh, for joining us. And also thank you all the board members and fellows who have volunteered to organize a meeting and also the panel discussion organizers and then panelists. And especially I'd like to express my special thanks to my graduate student, my PhD student, Adam Aaron Coletta, and he's been quite helpful, especially unlike the in-person meeting, I have only one student helper this year, and he's been quite really helpful and the hidden figure for this success meeting. Thank you very much. And without further ado, I wanna share some of those basic stats about meeting. And we all know with the pandemic, disrupted flows around the world or even within the US, but we're all joining from different parts of the world. So I'm gonna share some of those numbers with you. We didn't travel this year, but where are we all joining from? So a total of 138 participants from 17 different countries, about 60% of us, 80, 80 participants are from the US. The rest, about 40% from other 16 foreign countries. So the top five countries for among the uh, top five countries are uh, comprised about 84 percent, 116 participants, U.S. at the top, and followed by Korea, 18 participants, Italy, seven participants, and Brazil, six, and Japan, five participants. Yes, we are all from four. I mean, we are from four different continents: North America, about 60 percent; Asia, 20 percent. Europe, 14%, and South America, about 4%. I did a similar uh, type of update for the last in-person meeting in Napa Valley. It's quite similar. And we have some other countries who normally do not join, especially Brazil. We have many uh, new uh, members or new participants. Thank you. And what about, uh, we just take a look at compare the among the foreign countries, that these are the figures and I already briefly mentioned those 16 countries. And within the US, we have about 60% of the participants from all four different regions, census regions in the US. This is a US census region and division map we are all familiar with. And these are the composition of the origins. About 50 per, 54% uh, among 80 different participants from the US are from the West region. Yes, we are the Western Regional Science Association, but we are an international regional science association as well, as you saw it in the previous slides. About 47, 46% from the other three regions, and you will see this pie chart, the composition. Okay, let me now introduce our new officers for 2021 and 2022 period, and of course our incoming president, uh, 60 second incoming president, Professor Rick Church from University of California, Santa Barbara, who's going to give us a presidential address right after this award ceremony. Thank you. And of course, even before that, I should have mentioned that our immediate past president at the end of this award ceremony is Janet Kohase, who is a master of ceremony for this event. Thank you for your support and especially with the turmoil, with the pandemic, you've been very helpful to run this organization with me. And it's really, really uh, helpful and then very cooperative and then all those her, of her time, really appreciate and special thanks to you. And next as president elect is Professor Terry Clower of George Mason University. And he's gonna deliver his uh, presidential address next year in Scottsdale, Arizona. And we inducted our new vice president unanimously during our board meeting uh, two days ago, Professor, Ma Professor McKenna Kaufman from University of Hawaii Manoa. And congratulations. 
and she's going to deliver her presidential address in Hawaii in 2023. That's our next meeting, next Hawaii meeting. And also, congratulations to uh, Professor Yuri Mansuri from University of Illinois Institute of Technology. He's inducted uni uh, unanimously again during our board meeting as a new board member. Congratulations. Okay, next item on our agenda is uh, some announcement for the upcoming regional science meetings. Well, as you can see, all but last two are virtual. So the next regional science meeting in, by Southern Regional Science Association is a, it will be hosted as a virtual meeting in uh, April and Regional Science Association World Congress, which was originally uh, scheduled last year and now it is, it will be in virtual in May, late May. And Mid-Continental Regional Science Association uh, meeting will be, will go to virtual as well. It will be in June 9th through 11th. And also PRESCO, Pacific Regional Science Council, and as you know, the WRSA and the Japan section of RSAI, those are two founding members of the PRESCO, they have biannual summer institute, which will be hosted by the Vietnamese Regional Science Association, but it will be a virtual meeting in August. And European Regional Science Association in Italy, Bolzano and Bozen, that will, I mean, currently it is scheduled as a in-person meeting in August 24th, 27th. So we are all hopeful to meet uh, the regional scientists in upcoming meetings. And lastly, North American Regional Science Council in Denver that is scheduled in November 10th through 13th this year. And we're preparing this meeting in person. And of course, most importantly, our next year's meeting. So if we meet in 2022 in-person meeting in Scottsdale, Arizona will be our uh, first in-person meeting since 2019. So we'll have this meeting in a beautiful Scottsdale, Arizona, the Scott Resort and Spa. It's an easy walking distance from uh, the resort to the old town, downtown Scottsdale. And so beautiful sunshines in February, especially those coming from the cold region, including Sweden and including North Eastern part and especially Houston this year, Texas. Yeah, so this is a flyer. You will be able to find it at the on the last page of our program. And you will see these meeting spaces and some lobby we can get together and bring your family. So there's a nice pool and then weather in Scottsdale in February is always perfect. So February 17th and 20th is the meeting dates. And unlike our tradition, we usually start meeting on Wednesday and ends up around, I mean, the wrap up around Saturday. We'll have a Thursday through Sunday meeting. The reason for that is the 21st of February is a presidential day, so it's a holiday. So we have a long weekend. So bring your family and enjoy more days in beautiful Scottsdale. And of course, the full paper submission due is October 15th. For the last two meetings, including this one and the one in Hawaii, we were kind of flexible to extend and also even further extend by the end of the year, but that was with you know, this pandemic. So we'll stick to this uh, full paper submission due October 15th this year. And of course, you know, more detailed information will come on our uh, WRCA website and I'll send you an email reminder. I think that's all I have. And before I move, uh, toast it back to Janet, one quick announcement, uh, there will be the only one, I mean, the, there will be another special session scheduled for uh, tonight and that starts at 5.30 Pacific time. And it's organized by Sandy Daleva of Uni University of Illinois Urbana-Champaign. And there'll be the professional first uh, professional development workshop hosted by WRC, especially for those students, graduate students who's on the job market for those who are in the early career. And of course, all the scholars and who wants to share their opinions, please join us it's still in our program. Now back to Janet, thank you. Okay, great. Thank you, Jaywan, for all that uh, useful information. Uh, I think it might be appropriate now to do a virtual clap to thank Jaywan for all his work 
He's worked so hard on this meeting and all the other ones. So I'm gonna, I'll, I'll clap, you can maybe hear me. We can do thumbs up if anybody can see. Anyway, thank you so much, Jaywan, for all your work. I figure we need to have a public acknowledgement of it, okay? Um, okay, so moving on to the next item. It's actually something that I'm going to announce. And if you could show the next slide. Okay, great. Uh, um, I'm one of the three editors for the Annals of Regional Science. And every year, we three editors are part of the panel, are, are, are the panel to judge uh, papers that are submitted to the WRSA meetings by young scholars who've been out of uh, their post PhD for five years or less. So this year we read several papers and we are glad to announce the winner. Uh, but let me first say uh, the names of our editors. So uh, me, Janet Colhays from University of Houston, um, Martin Anderson from Lund University in Sweden, and Brian Kim from Seoul National University in um, Korea. Uh, we are the three editors. And what's interesting this year, you, this award used to be called the Springer Award, but because we had uh, recent uh, deaths of two of our founding fathers of the, of the journal, Roger Stowe, and um, Georgie Johansson, Johansson um, we lobbied to get the name of the award changed. And so now it's called the Stowe Johansson Springer Award. So that's kind of the history of how the award got to be named the way it was. So both um, Roger Stowe and Georgie Johansson were uh, uh, co-editors in chief. We have a, a practice of calling all of our editors co-editors and uh, editors in chief, but uh, Anyway, so it's kind of unusual at our journal. So without further ado, we, we read several really good papers. It was hard to make the decision, but the winning paper is by Gloria Cicciaroni from Gran Sasso Institute, Italy. And I've asked her to participate. And if we can see her, she can wave her hand or say a, a word or two. Uh, but let me read the name of her uh, paper. The title of her paper is Regional Artificial Intelligence and the geography of environmental technologies, does the digital transformation meet the green transition? So a very timely topic. And the paper uh, is joint with Alexandra Fagian, Sandra Montessera, and Francesco Pensuccini. So um, is Gloria there? I don't, ah, I do see her. Gloria, hi, do you wanna Good. say thank you? <laughs> Thank you. I'm, I'm really grateful to all the committee for this award. It is for me a great honor, of course, to be awarded uh, this prize. And I'm very pleased that uh, our paper has been selected for this prize, also because it deals with uh, an interesting research topic, the role that artificial intelligence has on eco-innovation. And uh, this topic, uh, there is a um, very huge hype around this topic. Uh, yes, the paper is uh, a, the result of a joint work with uh, Alessandra Fagian, Sandro Montresor, and Francesco Rentocchini. So I would like uh, to also thank my co-authors for their effort and their commitment to the project. Okay. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. And I believe the paper will be presented in a session tomorrow. Yeah. Uh, I think it's uh, session 5C, 8 a.m. Uh, Pacific time. And then here is the, if you can see it now, this is the um, certificate uh, made by Springer, our, uh, by Barbara Fess, who is the economics editor. She kind of oversees a lot of journals. So here is your award. I think you will get that sent to her and uh, your name's up there and then you get a, a monetary award too. So she'll take care of that. Thank you very much. Okay, very, Thank you. very pleasurable to do this. Okay. Thank you. Uh -huh. Okay. So now let's go on to the next award. Again, this is the award ceremony, so we have more awards. And the next award is called the 35th Annual Competition for the Charlie Charles Thibault Prize in Regional Science. And I'd like to introduce um, Matthias Ruth, who, who was the chair of the Reading Committee, uh, 20, uh, 2020 Reading Committee for the um, Thibault Prize. And again, uh, I think they received many papers and they had a lot of work to do and it was hard to make a final choice. But I'll, let, I'll turn it over to Matthias. I don't want to put words into your mouth. So yeah, thanks, Janet. In, in, yeah. Indeed, you know, we had 16 papers submitted uh, to, to the competition, uh, one of which uh, 
uh, in the late part uh, was withdrawn. So it left us with 15 really outstanding papers that met the requirements of the competition. A competition that's there to recognize the great contributions also of Charlie Tibu, uh, one of the founding fathers of regional science. Uh, not just an outstanding researcher and scientist, but also, uh, from what I hear, uh, an outstanding mentor of his students, uh, someone who really supported uh, the next generation of graduate students in particular. And so it's uh, fitting that this award really is named after him for the next generation of regional scientists who are part of the society and um, contributing to it. Uh, and with that, uh, I want to introduce four uh, of the top papers and authors of those papers uh, that made the cut, uh, two of which uh, are honorable mention papers. I'll get to those first. And then we have a, a sharing of the uh, top prize uh, by two individuals uh, who have uh, worked with uh, their advisors or others uh, on the papers that they have submitted. The first one is a paper by uh, Ijun Joy, uh, who received some uh, honorable mention for her paper on micro and macro level investigations of the impacts of transportation infrastructure on farm income in South Korea 20, uh, 2005 to 2015. She's the, uh, uh, Ijun Joy is the um, sole author of that paper, uh, which I wanted to point out. And Enjun uh, uh, Choi uh, is at Seoul National University, and the advisor is uh, Sang Wu Li, who actually has been uh, also a, uh, a contributor to uh, the competition in the past and, and has received recognition for that as well. So we have now so a longstanding pedigree where one uh, finalist or winner uh, becomes uh, the mentor for the next, which is all obviously so much in the spirit of uh, Charlie Tipu to start with. Um, the second um, honorable mention paper is for Protoy Aman Akbar uh, for a paper uh, entitled Who Benefits from Faster Public Transport? And um, he's at the University of Pittsburgh. Again, a soul also, something uh, worth mentioning. The advisor is Randall Walsh. And um, again, uh, someone uh, we want to welcome here to our community uh, and congratulate uh, for the achievement here in this uh, 35th competition. Now, drum roll, virtual or otherwise, uh, on to the uh, uh, joint recipients uh, of the next uh, um, sort of recognition of, of awards, the co-winners of the 35th competition for the Charles M. T. Boo Prize in Regional Science. Uh, one of these two is Seung Hoon Oh, uh, who receives a, uh, a recognition for the paper uh, on public transportation finance, agglomeration economies and equity, a dynamic panel analysis on the effect of transport operation revenues on employment growth and opportunities for low skilled workers in Ohio. This is a paper that was jointly uh, authored uh, with uh, 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 David uh, Brassington. Uh, both of them are at the University of Cincinnati, uh, and uh, the advisor is Rainer von Hofe. And uh, the other uh, major prize here is for uh, Noe Nava, uh, which is uh, entitled uh, Who Benefits from Agriculture? And uh, this is a paper that was co authored with uh, William Ridley and Sandy Del Arba. Sandy, obviously, many of you know, is, is on the board for the WRSA uh, and is also the advisor uh, for Noe Nava. Uh, the paper, um, again, you know, outstanding contribution to the field. And I want to congratulate uh, all of the finalists here and particularly the winners, the co-winners uh, of the prize. Congratulations. Matthias, we should invite them to say a few words, each winner. Indeed. Are here. Indeed, I was about to do this, and usually, uh, some of you do know, uh, we stand on a stage, we hand over the certificate, and with it also a check. Uh, unfortunately, can't do this now, and uh, instead, I would want to invite you if you're here. Uh, Hun Oh, I know you're here, I see you on my screen, if you want to go first. Okay. Yeah, uh, thank you very much. Uh, I'm really, truly honored to receive such a prestigious prize. 
So, and I really appreciate the reading committee for highly valuing our paper. It's been a, it's been a great educational experience since I have joined the regional science meetings since 2019. And I look forward to working and collaborating with the Regional Science Association in the future. So again, yeah, thank you very much. I am, I am very encouraged uh, by the award. Congratulations to you. And uh, is Noe Nava here? If, if you are, uh, yes, please. Here, please. Yes, here I'm here. Uh, this is uh, again such a great honor to be receiving such prestigious award and I want to take advantage of this opportunity to thank uh, the people of uh, my classmates from the second year paper class at the University of Illinois, uh, who every single who read every single version of it and were very tough to in their, in their comments. I also want to thank uh, the instructors, Professor uh, Nelson and Professor Garcia for also offering some guidance in this paper. And uh, last but not least, I want to thank uh, my, my advisor, Professor Sandy Dalerba, and my, my other, uh, other advisor, Professor Pirvilli, for being uh, very tough on me and always willing to um, improve this paper. Thank you very much to all of you. Congratulations to Noe. No, um, and um, Pratoy Aman Akbar, are you here? Yeah. Uh, hi, yeah, thank you. Thank you for, for recognizing, my, recognizing my research. Um, more generally, I, I study mass public transit networks and how they affect segregation and inequality in cities. And of course, transit offers lots of opportunities to reduce disparities in mobility, access to opportunities, and, and, but also poorly designed networks could segregate transit riders in low opportunity neighborhoods. So, so I think there's a lot of scope to study these questions using new sources of spatial data. It's great to see that you know a lot of the other winners all also study similar topics, and, and I hope um, this award recognition encourages more research on these topics among other young researchers. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, thank you, and congratulations. And last but not least, Angie Joy, please, if you're here. Yes. Um. Thank you very much. I feel so honored, and I also feel so thrilled to receive an award at this particular competition, where uh, my supervisor, Professor Lee himself was the TV Prize winner back in 1997. Um, I'd like to express my gratitude to the grading committee for reading my paper. And in fact, tomorrow is my big day convocation here in Korea. And I'm so happy to be able to complete my PhD journey receiving this uh, precious award. Um, I'll keep stay academically motivated and I would look forward to become an active member of WRSA as an independent uh, researcher. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thanks um, to all of you. And again, congratulations. And uh, back to you, um, uh, Janet or Jane Wan. Okay, great. Thank you. That was very interesting. Um, I encourage all of you uh, competitors for these competitions to submit your papers or consider submitting them to the Annals of Regional Science, which is the, uh, the journal of our association here. So keep us in mind. Okay. Uh, well, I think with that, we are ready for the, the highlight talk of this uh, presentation. We have our 60 second president coming in at the end of this speech, you will take the baton from me, right? Uh, so let me just give a, a brief introduction and then turn it over to Richard. Um, so Richard is distinguished professor emeritus of geography at UC Santa Barbara. And his research interests include spatial optimization, uh, natural resource management, operation research methods, and GIS. He's a great publisher, published over 250 papers in regional science, geography, and related fields. And he's very highly decorated and has received many honors. I'm just gonna mention a few of them. In 2009, he was elected to be a fellow of the Regional Science Association International, as well as the American Association for the Advancement of, of Science. So 2009 was a good year for you. Um, he was honored with a Lifetime Achievement Award in Location in 2012. He received the Outstanding Graduate Mentor Award from UC Santa Barbara in 2013. Uh, in 2018, he was recognized with the Walter Isard Award for Scholarly Achievement from NARSC. And then he won NARSC's uh, William Alonzo Memorial Prize for Innovative Work in Regional Science for his book with Alan Murray called Location Covering Models, History 
applications and advancements. Uh, his service to the Association of Regional Science is vast. He was the president of NARSC in 2015, president of SOLA in 2018, and he will be, he's the incoming president, 62nd president of the WRSA uh, at the completion of the ceremony. So without further ado, let me introduce him, uh, or his ad address, we can see this, the, the name up there, Regional Science, what about disruption and resilience? What an appropriate topic at an appropriate time. Okay, I will turn it over to you, Richard. Uh, thank you very much for those kind words, Janet. Um, let's see here, okay. I must admit, um, I had a bit of difficulty deciding what I wanted to talk about. And it wasn't until Jay Wan's email in early January that I said, oh my gosh, I really do need to select some type of topic. And um, um, on, um, I responded to him around the 10th of January and said, I'm gonna talk about disruption and resilience in regional science. And I can't say that I'm an expert in this. And there's um, Adam Rose, who's going to be the discussant, is far more of an expert in doing this than I am thinking about these issues than I am. But I thought it was timely uh, to talk about um, perhaps maybe we should be thinking outside the box more often and, uh, and, and addressing some of the things that could happen. Uh, maybe they're low probability events, but they could be extremely disruptive. And of course, uh, COVID-19 is, is just one of them, but I'm, I, I don't wanna um, talk about COVID-19. I think I'm, there's plenty of other things to talk about, especially given the fact that COVID-19 has been covered in a number of sessions uh, during this, uh, this meeting. Um, and of course, the most recent event in Texas uh, underscores um, actually the fact that we can develop uh, mitigation uh, approaches to perhaps um, um, keep us uh, out of danger from uh, falling into a major trap of, of disruption. Um, hmm. I'm, I'm having a problem here getting my screen to work here. Yeah, I think we're just seeing your first screen still. There we go, there we okay, go. Okay, great. Um, as I said before, I don't want to give you, um, you, you to think as this is and believe that we as regional scientists haven't done enough to uh, for instance, do we uh, search for those solutions and policies that produce greater levels of security and resilience? Now, um, Adam Rose was very, very kind to, um, to agree to be a discussant, and he's been working in this field for uh, quite some time, and, and I'm sure he will uh, correct me uh, for my mistakes as I, uh, as I stumble along this pathway. I want to give a little bit of terminology. I must admit that um, Adam said I was a little bit uh, loose in terms of my uh, discussion of terminology, um, in terms of um, a resil the use of the terms and so forth. So I'm going to I'm going to talk a bit about the terminology. Um, some notable research activities in disruption and the resilience. Um, I'm going to give you three examples just to get us in the mindset. In fact, maybe more than anything else, I just want to underscore the mindset that perhaps maybe we should have. And then what can we do? I just wanted to talk about very briefly about some text, techniques that we can employ. And then um, I'm gonna give a couple examples for how to analyze a possible disruption or even design for it. Um, so with that, um, I uh, was contacted by the US Bureau of uh, reclamation not all that long ago and asking for my ideas um, and and perhaps my service in a project that they had funded internally within the context of the Southwest Division um, of the Bureau of Reclamation. 
And this research proposal, basically, that I took the words right out of uh, the context of the proposal, is designed to, to develop a sustainably uh, more resilient, a robust and refined holistic approach to the regional security program and the regional safety of dams program by examining the regional water delivery system called a systems approach and modern risk-based safety to identify critical nodes essential to accomplishing reclamation's mission of delivering water to entitlement holders based on established allocations. At the completion of the research project, reclamation leadership may decide to allocate security, fortification, and guard force resources in a somewhat different way, excuse me, um, in a somewhat different way um, or a modified manner than is in current practice. And the idea is that um, they're looking, this, this research proposal kind of led me to think, well, perhaps maybe other organizations and so forth should be doing more of it. Not to say that we haven't been, and, uh, uh, but that we should pay more attention. Some terminology. Um, disruption, I'll define here disruption as, uh, as uh, uh, disturbance or problems which interrupt an event, activity, or process. That's right out of the Oxford Dictionary. Uh, fragility. Uh, the quality of being easily broken or damaged, resilience, the capacity to recover quickly from difficulties or toughness. Now, um, Adam Rose uh, suggests that resilience is our capacity to bounce back, if you will, um, once uh, we've had some kind of disruptive event. Um, Economic resilience, right out of Adam Rose, one of Adam Rose's papers, is the ability of economic entities to maintain function and recover quickly from a disaster. Now, um, we can we can go further and talk about mitigation. Mitigation are actions that could be taken before in a disaster to reduce the potential losses. This could be fortification, hardening, a lot of different kinds of actions. Uh, perhaps moving away from a floodplain and so on. Um, the uh, engineering uh, uh, Re resilience engineering association says uh, engineering resilience is a system as resilient if it can adjust its functioning prior to, during, or following events, and thereby sustain required operations. And resilient design as defined by the International Risk Governance Center at, uh, um, at the Ecole Polytechnique Federal de, uh, in Lausanne, Switzerland. They define it as designing a system to maintain a pre-designated level of capability following a disturbance. So I'm going to give you an example of uh, perhaps a model that we can use or define for uh, making systems more resilient by designing them in the first place. Now, if we have a system in operation, we can think about how we might want to um, help improve the, the resilience after the, the capabilities of bouncing back in many ways by doing some kind of mitigation. Okay, I just wanna point out that um, there, was a, there was one other item that made me think about um, this issue about uh, uh, disruption. And that is that uh, somebody shared with me uh, a report called SPARS, which was the um, St. Paul um, Acute Respiratory Syndrome, and it's called SPARS. And this was a, this was a, a completely hypothetical virus they called it a coronavirus that was an exercise that was done in 2017 by the Health Security Center at Johns Hopkins University. And this was a process that was um, guided in to a great extent by Olga V and Schwartz's uh, Plotting Your Scenario uh, paper. And uh, what was really quite interesting is if you look at all of the 
issues that we have encountered during the COVID-19 pandemic, especially within the context of communication issues. Do you wear a mask or you do not wear a mask? Should we close businesses? Should we not? And so forth. These are all raised in the spars, this hypothetical planning scenario that was produced by Johns Hopkins University three years ago. And all of the issues that we've encountered here were identified by them by thinking outside the box. And um, it would, in a certain way, it kind of makes you think that, you know, we have the capability to do a lot of things, but even when we do, they don't necessarily get recognized as being as important as they are. Because anybody that reads that report, had read that report before, would know a lot more about how to react to it, uh, the conditions today. <clears throat> okay. There, I, I have to admit, there are a lot of notable ac research activities in disruptions, mitigation, and resilience. And um, uh, I just want to underscore two uh, places that I think are really um, leading uh, the way. Um, the CREATE Center at uh, University of Southern California. Um, they focus on terrorism and natural hazards. Um, and the Risk Center at ETH Zurich, by the way, they also have a co-center at the University of Singapore. And they focus on types of disruption, including cyber attacks, um, uh, transportation system disruptions and so forth. Anyway, the, the US government has also generated significant data on possible disruptions of lifelines that can be found in, if you dig deep enough, you'll find them in, in um, the websites of the various agencies like USDOT, USDOE, USGS and so on. I, don't, I obviously don't wanna give you the impression that we aren't doing anything as regional scientists. But I don't think as regional science that we play a large enough role in this, and we can. At the CREATE Center, just to underscore a few of the things that they do there, um, they basically, this is right off their website. In fact, even the pictures are. The economic, their economic analysis theme is focused on estimating the consequences and costs of terrorism and natural hazards, as well as evaluating investment decisions and mitigation and resilience um, to reduce risks. Uh, these uh, issues occur at both the level of an individual's organization, op operational decisions, as well as economy-wide through sectorial supply chain interdependency. And they uh, employ techniques such as benefit cost analysis on the micro level and more on the macro level, uh, computable uh, general equ equilibrium models and input to output models. Uh, and there's a quite a, a wealth of information that has been published by Adam Rose and other people at the Create Center at UCS, USC. The uh, risk center at ET. Uh, ETH Zurich is really quite an interesting enterprise. It includes people from in, across the entire university in terms of re representation as stakeholders. Um, they, they basically uh, deal with um, serving as the interface, if you will, between academia, um, industry, civil and, and governmental authorities. The center's research output helps uh, society and industry better manage risk portfolios and design novel solutions for collaborative and risk reduction and resilience enhancing schemes. Um, again, um, these um, uh, these two these two are centers good examples of of activities that are that um, are have involved quite a bit of research. But I think, as I said before regional sciences, scientists can play a much larger role than they are right now. Um, some uh, questions, kind of questions that we might ask ourselves in uh, the regional science community might be something like, should we pay more attention to uh, disruption and the risk of uh, the race? Um, have we attempted to estimate the economic costs and 
impacts of potential uh, disruptive events? Do we really think outside the box, um, as Olga V and Schwartz uh, suggested? Have we developed the appropriate tools to analyze and mitigate risk and, un and uncertainty facing cities and regions? Do we, uh, do we ignore low probability events that can be catastrophic unless we plan for them? Um, problems in, of disruption, I don't have to go through this entire list, but they can include everything from terrorism, uh, infrastructure failures, cyber attacks, climate change, pandemic risk, um, and so on. And, and, and I might underscore supplies, shortages in supply chains. The um, COVID-19 has uh, increased the demand for certain uh, computer chips and so forth in um, lots of personal computer devices and phones and so forth. And that has taken away the capability of producing knee chips for cars and automobiles. And um, it, has, it has caused uh, chip supplies have just been disrupted so much to the extent that um, Ford, Honda, GM, Chrysler, Fiat, VW, and others have actually shut their plants or killed their production of certain models for more than a few days, for weeks and even months. It's very costly to the impact to automobile, automobile makers, if you will, when the cost of such of these components is really quite small. And in fact, that's why GM has talked to their suppliers and now wants them to have a full year supply, stock supply of some of these critical components, but they're really very small and cheap in terms of the over all costs of the car uh, on hand so that they won't face these kinds of disruptions in the future. Now, I have three examples that I want to discuss within the context of uh, just to highlight some issues. Um, after all, this is a talk that's supposed to occur during a, uh, a luncheon time. Uh, uh, time and, and we're all supposed to be enjoying our lunch and maybe having a glass of wine and so forth. And so uh, hopefully you don't have to pay so much attention. Um, anyway, the, I, I wanna cover three examples. One is the energy in Europe with a focus on natural gas uh, as a political risk uh, issue. Lights out uh, the Midcalf uh, substation attack that occurred here in California a uh, few years ago, and then ArcStorm, the planning scenario of the USGS. Now, natural gas production in Europe is this um, blue line um, right here at the bottom. Uh, natural gas production in Europe is on the decline since 2008 uh, at the base year of this graphic. And renewable energy and so forth and over there is, is on the increase. But overall, energy um, total production is slightly on the decline. Now, the issue is natural gas is one of the key fuels to help transition us to more of a green um, future. And if we look at um, the gross inland consumption of natural gas in Europe, you'll see that um, it's been pretty much of a plateau um, since uh, 2004. Not a major amount of change. Um, if we uh, then uh, think about the fact that uh, nearly 90% of natural gas is now imported and use will be relatively high for the next 20 years, that means that uh, Europe is no longer, you know, as self-sufficient as it was within the context of energy, especially um, the fact that they're no longer relying as much on coal and natural gas uh, pr production is uh, in the decline. But almost three quarters of European Union's imports of natural gas comes from Russia. Um, and that share is going to be increasing. Now, um, there, was, there is a historic gas link between Russia and the European Union, and that goes through uh, the Ukraine. And, and there was a disruption um, because of 
uh, pricing issues and so forth with Ukraine. And um, uh, Russia cut off the supply for a period of time. And you can actually see that in this graph on um, here in this field here, April 9, uh, there was a Russian and Ukraine not able to agree on price and therefore there was uh, no natural gas exports to Europe during that period of time. Okay, so um, until recently, Northern Europe received um, all of its natural gas from two pipelines, all of the natural gas from Russia, they received it from two pipelines through, uh, through Ukraine. And they, those are the pipelines right a map there. Um, but um, <clears throat> this disruption um, of gas deliveries uh, occurred for about a six month period of time, but it might be a long-term strategy of Russia to uh, you think about the disruption that uh, Ukraine caused as a kind of a political slash pricing event. Uh, Russia then embarked immediately on a couple, few years later on building Nord Stream, which is a pipeline under the Baltic to Germany uh, from directly from Russia. So they didn't have to they didn't have to bother with with the uh, uh, Ukrainian, potentially Ukrainian, even embargoing uh, Soviet gas or Russian gas. Now, um, the uh, Nord Stream 2 is a pipeline that is, there's only about 100 miles left to lay in this uh, pipeline. It doubles the capacity of the direct route from uh, Russia. And it's, uh, as I said, it's now under construction. And it's a second um, pipe that will soon be probably in operation. And it, perhaps uh, almost eliminates the need to transport gas through the Ukraine to the European Union, except that you know, there are some gas lines that go through the Ukraine to go more towards Turkey. And so forth. Okay, so uh, let's talk about this dependency for a moment. If we uh, look at the European Union, uh, their, their dependency on natural gas and even oil for that matter, um, it forms a backdrop of policy concerns related to the security of energy supplies for the European Union. And the pipeline has always been controversial. It brings Russian gas directly to Germany under the Baltic Sea uh, with the aim of providing the country, especially Germany, with affordable energy as it phases out nuclear and coal. Criticals, uh, critics have argued that German uh, that makes Germany too reliable on this uh, energy source. And in fact, one, one um, uh, economist um, that is uh, that's quoted in this in The Economist in September 2020 said Germany could easily afford it. He said, describing the impact, uh, this is uh, the possibility of axing the pipeline. We could easily afford to ax this pipeline. Um, and describing the economic output as negligible. And I, I think I tend to agree with that assessment. But at the same time, um, another person said, um, I hope the Russians don't force us to change our position on Nord Stream 2. And, and resulting, this was a conversation about um, the Navalny's um, uh, poisoning by uh, Russia. And um, saying that because that has uh, that has increased tensions between Europe and Russia, and so the issue is that we can ask ourselves a question: Have economists and regional science clearly estimated the trade-offs in terms of costs and benefits to reduce reliance on an adversary to supply significant amounts of energy to Europe, uh, to Germany? There are options to not rely on this pipeline. In fact, one of the options is to build a few more ports uh, that are capable of handling LNG from other places like uh, Northern Africa. Okay, that's something that uh, it seems like it's uh, really clearly lacking in the uh, uh, European function right now in terms of 
what are we what are we placing ourselves in terms of so much of a heavy reliance on Russia? Now, I'd like to talk just a few minutes about, as a next example, fragility in our own energy grid. And no, I'm not going to talk about um, uh, Texas <laughs> uh, at the moment. Um, we normally take our electrical grid uh, to be very reliable, and few of us have invested in backup supply systems and so forth. But two events should suffice to uh, demonstrate that we rely on something that might be fragile, that is capable of easily being disrupted. And one is the blackout of 2003, and the other one is the uh, mid-cap substation attack in uh, 2013. Okay, so the uh, 2003, if any of you uh, are familiar, was caused by uh, a tree branch that touched a high power transmission line near Cleveland, Ohio in August 14, 2003. And that was also caused by uh, a software bug in the alarm system. And it prevented the energy company in Ohio, First Energy, uh, knowing the need to redistribute power on the other to other lines and so there was a surge in power in that line and uh, several other lines resulting in a lost line created. And this lost line, power line, created a system of cascading failures across the network, shutting down 508 generation plants, 265 of two, uh, concentrated at 265 power plants during the outage. Um, luckily, most of the system was able to respond in six hours, but uh, how many people were affected by this? 50 million people, including these are uh, in Northeast United States, as well as a um, uh, province or two in Canada. Now, the Mitcalf uh, substation is another example of perhaps maybe we should be thinking outside the box a little bit more than we do. This was a sniper attack of, on a substation where the snipers had AK-47s, night vision goggles. Um, as, as far as we can tell, um, this, this particular um, uh, attack was extremely low cost. What they did is that prior to the attack, they cut the uh, fiber optic communication cable uh, by AT&T. And um, these, uh, these gunmen focused their attack um, on 17 electrical transformers. Um, and in a matter of about 40 minutes or so, they caused $15 million worth of equipment damage. But this is the thing, is that with fast response by PG&E and Cal ISO, that's the independent service operator for, for California in terms of power, uh, they prevented a blackout of the entire Silicon Valley. And they, uh, it's been estimated if the attack was completely successful, um, Silicon Valley could have been blacked, for, blacked out for a month. Now, um, there's uh, some very interesting reports, one on the physical security of the power, uh, uh, power grid in Performic uh, 2014, and I've gathered some of that information. But what I want to point out here is that these heavy, uh, these high, high voltage transformers cost between 2.5 and 7.5 million, and they take about 12 months to manufacture. And the problem is, is what are our capabilities this would be for, you know, in, within the context of what Avin Rose would say, what are our capabilities to respond to such an attack in terms of, of, of um, our capabilities of, of replacing those transformers easily and, and so on. And it turns out that um, we have um, over the last, uh, between 2000, uh, five in 2013, um, the uh, total am amount of um, of uh, large transformers, um, including medium and high voltage units, imported into the into the United States, have more than doubled. 
that is relying more on, it used to be that we built all of them here in the United States. Now we rely on, on two thirds of our production capabilities for these transformers elsewhere. They, take, they can take even two years to build depending upon how complex they are. And, um, and one uh, manufacturer said, if somebody were to intentionally try um, to, it's a surprisingly uh, simple task and there are a number of ways to uh, really damage a transformer beyond repair. So um, let's just look at this just a little bit um, in terms of asking some questions. So how long would it take to recover? How long would it take to recover from a successful attack? And how much impact would this cause to the uh, economy of a region? And how do we balance out the costs of an impact with the costs of prevention slash protection and backup capabilities versus the cost of, the, of, of a series of events? And in fact, it turns out that the US is requiring that there be um, a back, uh, you know, a storage of these transformers, some of these transformers being made so that we actually have some in advance to that we can plug into the system. But these oftentimes are a little bit more um, one of a kind kinds of things. So there's not one size fits all, but nevertheless, trying to improve that capability. Now, um, I, I, there's one thing that I forgot to mention is that uh, within the context of the MITCAF, there was a study that FERC, the Fed, uh, Federal um, Energy uh, Regulatory Commission uh, had, did, that was, um, that was covered in the Wall Street Journal. And they suggested that there were 30 key areas uh, 30 key substations across the United States that if nine of them were attacked, it could bring down the entire grid in the US. Now, the next, the next topic I wanna to talk about is Arc Storm. This is uh, something that uh, Adam Rose is very familiar with because he was one of the study participants. It's a very large uh, group of scholars and, and researchers. Um, yeah, part of this multi-hazard demonstration project of the US Geological Survey. Arc Storm stands for sort of an atmospheric river. That's A-R. K stands for thousand and it's a storm, an atmospheric river um, climate event that occurs in um, for California. And um, and they say that this is an event that would be reached or exceeded every 500 or 1,000 years. Based upon the, inst and this is all, this, this uh, scenario was based upon an intense California set of winter storms in 1860 and 1861 that left the Central Valley of California impassable. It killed off a third of the livestock in the state of California. And in fact, it led to a substantial change in land ownership in the Central Valley from, from Mexican rancheros, ranchos uh, to uh, completely different uh, ownership. So it had a significant impact, not just on the economy, but also in terms of our culture and our, and our history, historical land ownership. Uh, this, the arc storm was, as I said, it was based on, on this um, event that occurred in 1861. This uh, storm left the Central Valley covered in water in places uh, uh, to a depth of 10 to 20 feet. Uh, geological records suggest that su such storms occurred in, in the periods 1235 to 1360, 1395 to 1410. And, and all the way to 1810 to 20, and then 1861, 62. Um, it's a, like a one. It's a, like a one mega flood every 100 to 200 years. Now, estimates included in this in this project uh, flooding the Central Valley, hypothetical flooding of 300 miles long and 20 miles wide. Serious flooding occurs in um, 
Orange County, Los Angeles County, San Diego County, San Francisco Bay Area, and other coastal communities. There are hundreds of landslides across the state that damage roads and highways and homes. Property damage exceeds 300 billion, which is about two and a half times Harvey. Agricultural losses um, and other costs to repair lifelines, they estimated to be 100 billion. Um, business interruption costs would total 325 billion. And this would also involve the evacuation of perhaps 1.5 million residents in the inland region and Delta counties. Um, if we, uh, this, this, by the way, follows um, the, uh, another report that GS, USGS, uh, in terms of their multi-hazard demonstration project associated with a, the great shakeout. It was a scenario for uh, having a 7.8 earthquake hitting Southern California. And basically what they found out was, what they estimated was that the damages of arc storm um, would be um, three times that of the earthquake damages. <clears throat> now, arc storm is only an estimate. And I think it's a very, very fine study and they've done a, a tremendously good job, but it's only an estimate. And we should even be looking closely at those kinds of things to see, are, they, are there problems that we uh, still need to address? Now, um, Arc Storm, uh, in, this is a quote, this is the second part of the saying here, oops. Uh, Arc Storm does not pose at any dam overtopping failure for any of the state operated dams. And, uh, but um, this, this project, Arc Storm, uh, about seven years ago, uh, was followed by an atmospheric river event in 2017. This is a far less uh, um, involved storm as the atmospheric river in Arc Storm, their scenario, more like the 1861 storms. But this was a very much a more modest atm atmospheric storm event that was concentrated in Northern California, including the Feather River, River Valley. And so let's look at the, I'm, not, I'm quite, not quite sure how much time I have left here. Uh, let's see, you have about, uh, I'll say 10 minutes. Okay, good. Um, I'll take 15 now. Um, let's look at the Oroville, Oroville Dam for a moment. It's the second largest dam in California after Shasta. It's the highest dam in the United States. Not very many people recognize that. It's 770 feet tall, built and operated by the Department, uh, California Department of Water Resources, part of the um, state water project. Oroville has not been on any list of high risk dams. Okay, so this fits, I'm sorry again. <clears throat> Too many revolutions. <clears throat> Let's look at the Oroville Dam. Um, it was uh, not on any list of high risk dams, um, in, but this, uh, there was a Febu uh, in February, 2017, an emergency was called due to an atmos this atmospheric river event that I'm talking about. This is a picture of the dam on the Feather River. Um, and um, there, there, is, there are two spillways. One's the main spillway, which is typically used when the reservoir fills up. And then there's an emergency spillway when the reservoir can't handle all of the capacity in the uh, main spillway. So, in uh, early February uh, 2017, um, the main spillway starts to show signs of failure. And, and uh, the lower picture here, a few days later after the discharge was uh, reinitiated because they said, oh my gosh, our fifth spillway is failing. They stopped the flow and they let the level rise further in the reservoir, creating more of a hazard potential. And then, 
they recognized that um, they couldn't do that because too much water was coming uh, into the reservoir. So they uh, reinitiated the discharge. So this is uh, kind of gives you another picture of the uh, further signs of failure. But the use of the emergency spillway was started due to the substantial damage to the main spillway and the high snow and rain runoff. Okay, as you can see from this picture, there's an, there are areas right here, right underneath the spillway that is starting to erode. And in fact, erosion immediately adjacent to the spillway set off an alarm uh, that, they, that this emergency spillway berm could fail, spin, sending a 30 foot wall of water downstream. And this led to an evacuation, call for evacuation of 1,000 liters downstream. A view of the image after the, after the event showed significant damage to the, to the regular way. Completely rebuilt, and uh, to the point that it underscored how how uh, vulnerable the emergency uh, spillway was to death. But it's not that we didn't know this because we did. Uh, erosion of the emergency uh, spillway was first predicted in court documents by environmentalists more than a decade ago. And a technical memo, memo on Lake Oroville's discharge, the Yuba County Water Agency wrote in 2002, that if the emergency spillway is, is used, extensive erosion would take place. They knew all of this. And so what I'm basically suggesting is, the issue is that arc storm estimates may need to be, uh, may indeed be a lower estimate on the true damage. And that it's probably time to even kind of return to arc storm as an arc storm too, perhaps. But I'm not saying that it wasn't a good report, it wasn't good analysis, but I don't think they had all of the pieces together and recognizing that there are critical components within the context of our dam system that is, that is potentially vulnerable. And just to kind of give you an idea of what that might mean, here is, here is a map of the um, uh, California dams that are considered to be either um, um, significant hazard potential or red dots or high hazard potential dams. So we have quite a few dams in the state and some of these hazards are associated with earthquakes, but a great deal of them are associated with the uh, under design of spillways and the possibility that we can operate them poorly during uh, a major emergency event. Okay, so um, the next thing I want to do is I want to give just talk about possible uh, approaches that we can model. And um, one of the things that Adam Rose has spent quite a bit of time on is. Um, CGEs, uh, input output models, benefit cost analysis. Um, we can uh, do scenario, strategic scenario and planning uh, teams and so forth. But one of, the, one of the places that we can do this is in optimization and uh, maybe trying to design for resilience like what the Engineering Design uh, Resilience Design uh, Association suggests. So an example of an optimization resilient design, or maybe we'll call it robust design, in uh, goods or services are concentrated at points of supply and production. To what degree are such elements critical to goods and service delivery and how might they be protected? We might talk about how we could do this. Protected might be a mitigation, but we might want to design them in so, such a way that we can, uh, the system will be um, uh, operate really quite well, even after it's been disrupted. Okay, so um, location modeling. Um, we can think of two things. Uh, uh, we can think of the traditional P-median model is, as a model that is used for design of facilities and trying to uh, reduce costs of delivery items to uh, places, um, keep accessibility high and so forth. The traditional model is the best case. We don't even assume that there will be any loss. 
There is an unreliable model in the literature, and that is the average case. We kind of expect that they all have a certain level of reliability in what will, uh, what will the expected loss be. And then uh, they try to design, they try to locate the unreliable facilities in order to make them as reliable as possible as a, as a system. Uh, the interdiction is we can think of a system and trying to figure out what the most important components are that if we remove them, we uh, will damage the system the most. Um, and that's um, identifying the worst case loss. And that's, there's a model called the R interdiction median problem. And then fortification, we might think of mitigation to mitigate against the worst case losses or even average case loss for that matter. All of these models belong in the uh, are in the literature in some form or another. And I have re references, but I want to focus right now on the integration of these traditional and interdiction problems in designing in such a way that we might think about making things more resilient or robust once a disruption happens. The interdiction model uh, looks for the worst case, and I'm not going to go over all this detail here, but it's this is uh, published in the Annals of uh, the uh, American Association of Geographers. And then um, this, uh, this median model, this R interdiction median model, looks for the worst case facilities, you know, in terms of uh, removing uh, R facilities from a system of P operating facilities that, that uh, results in the worst uh, level of service after, after interdiction or disruption in this case. Interdiction is this term that comes right out of the military literature that has a long history of looking at disruption and protection. So if we look at um, uh, the interdiction P median problem, um, on the right or on the left is an optimal solution to the P median problem. And uh, this has a weighted distance, I don't know whether you can read it, of 2,950 uh, units, distance units. And this is a, a disruption of two facilities. And if we disrupt two facilities, the, the overall efficiency of the, end, uh, of the system decreases by 100%. In fact, it goes from 2,950 to 6,124, a substantial disruption to the system. So if we want to look at um, anticipating in such possible losses, we might even think about designing this when we are locating our facilities in the first place of locating, perhaps in a, in a P-median sense, locate a set of facilities such that that the worst case law of R of the P facilities, that is the remaining facilities, yield the lowest possible weighted distance. That is, it, it operates even after, after being disrupted as best as possible. Now, um, that, that leads us to um, reserve, uh, resilient slash robust design, um, the P median problem. This is Rick, not- Can I interrupt for a second? Can you yeah. finish in about seven minutes? Oh, I'll be finished in about two or three minutes. Oh, okay. Okay, Great. I'm Thank sorry. You. I'm sorry, it's okay. Okay, so uh, we can think of this in a, in a, in a sense as a bi-level problem. Bi-level optimization problems are really quite difficult to solve. And at the bottom lower level is an expanded um, R interdiction median problem. Uh, because it, it, there, there's a trick that you can make in the interdiction median problem to create a two-level problem into a one-level problem. So this lower-level problem represents the interdictor or the disruptor, and uh, as well as the optimal response to the disruptor. It's really, a, a, an, I think, an ingenious model. But if we put on top of that the location model, the upper level, where we're locating our facilities. And then the, then the middle level is this disruptor that is um, disrupting the facilities. And then built in this is the optimal response or the response to as resilient response as possible. This, is a, this makes a, a very nice bi-level uh, model for resilient design. Now, what do we get out of it? Well, there's, um, if we look at resilient design for two, 
<clears throat> here's a facility. This is a five facility pattern. This was the optimal P median solution, 2950. This is the interdiction of that of two facilities, 6,224. So if we look for a resilient system, we can find that there's a system that's 3,055, but the worst case loss of two of those five facilities produces a, a weighted distance value of 4,613, substantially reducing the potential impact of, of uh, disruption. Now, I'm not necessarily saying that that's where we want to design our systems, but we ought to be looking for those kinds of possible disruptions to, to guide us as to what's the cost of that, the operational costs of it without disruption, the operational costs of it with disruption, and looking at the overall benefit costs of, of uh, producing more resilient designs in our planning, whatever that might be. Now, I'm, I'm gonna skip over this next one, um, which is an example, a special case of just one, R equals one, that's losing one facility out of a system because there's some very special cases that you can do there. And I'm not gonna, I'm, I'm, I'm just gonna directly go to the uh, concluding comments here. My, my overall um, reason for giving this talk today is I think we shouldn't ignore the possibility of disruption in many of the things that we analyze. And I think that Ogilvy and Schwartz, when they said, you really need to think outside the box to uh, bring those possibilities into your, into your scenarios and planning is very, very important. Um, the current techniques and models, I think that may not adequately capture the impacts of significant losses of a loss, uh, resource lifeline. And, and um, I think we should look for what's critical in a system and think about the ways in which we can protect them, design for more flexibility and enhance resilience in a cost beneficial manner. And with that, I thank you very, very much for your time and your attention. Great, thank you for a wonderful presentation, very thought provoking. Thank you very much, Richard. Um, so now let me move on to introducing the discussant. And uh, the discussant, you've heard his name mentioned several times in the presentation is Adam Rose. And he's a research professor in the University of Houston, um, no, uh, he not University of Houston, sorry, University <laughs> of Southern California, sorry. My brain is going wrong here. Are you making You're me a job offer? Uh, yeah, yeah, whoops, that, that's not supposed to be public, sorry. <laughs> University of Southern California, uh, Saul Price School of Public Policy. And he's a director of USC's Center for Risk and Economic Analysis of Terrorism Events, or popularly known as CREATE. And his primary research interest is the economics of disasters. And he also likes to look at energy and climate change policy in his research very widely published and he has more than 250 papers and several books. He's an active in regional science and related fields. He is served or is serving on editorial boards of I think around 20 journals. Uh, in 2017, he was elected as a fellow of the Regional Science Association International and was also elected to be president of the International Society for Integrated Risk Management in that same year. And in 2020, he won a Pace Setter Award for Excellence in Advocacy and Policy Innovation, along with his colleague at USC, uh, Dan White. So with that introduction, uh, Adam, I guess you can continue to disrupt or maybe compliment. <laughs> right? I will turn myself off. Do so you have well, 10 minutes, I'll, but you can take 15 if you want. All right. <laughs> I'll, I'll be complimenting uh, Rick with both spellings. Uh, complimenting him with an eye on the wonderful talk um, and great ideas put forth and then complimenting him in my discussion. So I've got a PowerPoint and uh, I guess the question is bringing it up. Uh, could you, Rick, could you stop? Oh, I'll stop, I'll stop, yeah. Uh, there we go. So if I share screen, I got this here and I've got this here. Oh yeah, and hopefully this will this will work. This will work great. 
So uh, since Rick mentioned it, I'm gonna talk a little bit about the Center for Risk and Economic Analysis of Terrorism Events, uh, partly because it's got such a strong regional science. <coughs> so um, as far as the uh, CREATE goes, it was the first of these DHS University Centers of Excellence in research and education uh, set up after 9-11. Uh, there are other well-known versions of these like START at um, Maryland, ALERT at Northeastern, for example, Critical Infrastructure Resilience Institute at um, the University of Illinois. So they're intended to be <clears throat> independent outfits doing university uh, research. Uh, started out with more basic research, but it's gotten a little more applied over the years as Congress keeps asking, well, you know, what's the practical outcome of all this money we're, we're spending on you? So uh, despite the ominous sounding name and term of terrorism, we're really an all hazards center. In fact, I've been doing a lot of work on COVID-19 recently. So the strong regional science tradition goes back to Harry Richardson and Peter Gordon, who were uh, part of the original CREATE team and active for the first eight years. Uh, their, two of their prime <clears throat> PhD students, Ji Young Park and uh, Bum Su Lee now have tenure <clears throat> in planning departments at uh, University of at Buffalo and, and the University of Illinois, respectively. I actually joined CREATE in 2005 while I was still at Penn State. And uh, CREATE was one of the things that brought me out, attracted me to USC. And uh, more recently, some of the former uh, students and uh, postdocs, Dan Wei and Zhenhua Chen, are active in regional science, have come through CREATE. Zhenhua now is uh, an assistant professor at Ohio State in planning. Uh, we've also had prominent people in related fields, Howard Kunruther, the leading economist in the economics of natural disasters, Todd Sandler, the leading economist in the economics of terrorism, as well as major people in risk and decision analysis listed there. Uh, my work goes all the way back to the 1990s in my association with the multiple uh, multidisciplinary center for earthquake engineering research. Um, headquartered at, at the University at Buffalo, and a regional scientist Barclay Jones is the one that, that got me interested and involved in CREATE and led to the, my first publication to mention resilience in the JRS in 1997, and then one in which I you know, specified the definitions and showed how you could incorporate resilience into a computable general equilibrium model. Uh, with Xu Yi Lao in, in 2005. So my more recent collaboration has been with people active in regional science, Noah Dormady, now an associate professor of public policy at Ohio State, Dan Wei and Zhenhua Chen, who I've mentioned before. Uh, I might mention though, one of the things about CREATE is we do a lot of research, but we are actually pretty short on uh, work on spatial and network analysis and perhaps Rick can help us remedy that. So putting Rick's uh, contribution in context, uh, the spatial aspects of resilience have not been extensively studied, but let me make a distinction right off the bat between what we call mitigation strategies, primarily deal with protection. These are well studied, uh, ranging from land use planning as a major mitigation strategy to individual facility siting to network system vulnerability. But resilience strategies, which deal more with business continuity and recovery as opposed to product protection, uh, those are less well studied, but optimal recovery in terms of the covering problem, flexibility and modularity have great potential. Uh, optimal self-organizing is a major theme. Uh, stemming from ecology that can be applied. Um, speed of system restoration is important as well and can be analyzed in a spatial network context. And, and so are the trade-offs between protection and accessibility. So uh, let me start with uh, clarifying some a major distinction. So there are a couple of two major interpretations of resilience. Uh, one group refers to uh, resilience as any action that reduces hazard losses. And, but to me, there's a perfectly good word for actions taken before the event, and that's mitigation. And, and so the group that 
prefers resilience to cover any action is generally engineers who work a lot on building codes and, and dikes and levees, et cetera. And so they've incorporated mitigation into resilience. But I think the best use of the term resilience are actions taken after the event strikes. And this is more consistent with the Latin root of resilience, resilio, which is to bounce back or rebound. So, but it's important to emphasize you can build up resilience capacity beforehand because resilience is a process. You can stockpile goods, uh, undertake emergency drills, purchase emergency generators, identify backup locations and suppliers. But these tactics are not implemented until after the disaster strikes. So that's what we mean by sort of post-disaster actions. And that's what I think is a, we've never had a good term to represent all of those. So I like to reserve resilience for that. So it's important to note you can only prevent property damage before the event, uh, not afterwards. And a lot of people say, well, what's left? And they totally ignore the flow counterpart to the stock aspects of property damage and that's business interruption and this begins when the disaster strikes until continues until you've recovered and this is typically measured in terms of lost sales revenue gdp and employment and uh, business interruption in many cases recently has been larger than than property damage, four times as much in the case of uh, the World Trade Center attacks, larger in case of Hurricane Katrina, partly because it took so long for New Orleans to recover. So I've studied resilience in about 10 disciplines, ecology, organizational behavior, engineering, sociology, uh, economics, and generally found more commonalities and differences. And what I've presented here are some basic definitions. Rick presented one of them, but it, it starts by providing a general definition of the essence of resilience and then the economic counterpart. So the general definition is ability of a system to maintain function when shocked. This is attributable to Buzz Halling, a prominent ecologist who put this forth in the 1970s is usually thought to be the father of modern resilience. Well, the economic counterpart is the efficient use of remaining resources at a given point in time to produce as much as possible to maintain function. And so this is in keeping with the definition of economics as the science of scarcity. You want to use those remaining resources as efficiently as possible. The dynamic definition, the general a version of the ability and speed of a system to recover. And again, from an economic standpoint, this is the efficient use of resources over time for investment and in repair and reconstruction, including expediting the process and adapting to change. And from these, we can come up with a metric uh, of resilience, which is basically averted losses as a percentage of potential losses that we have applied. So here are some resilience tactics and they basically emanate from production theory and they relate to things like changing the productivity parameter in the case of conservation to substitution possibilities in terms of input substitution, import substitution, management effectiveness again is a productivity parameter adjustment, uh, relocation gets you into a spatial dimension um, resource pooling is a joint effort in terms of inventories and stockpiling. And we have, in fact, uh, measured the, uh, I need to move this piece around. We've measured resilience through surveys after Hurricane Harvey and Superstorm Sandy. And we've come up with essentially cost effectiveness ratios, benefit cost ratios. Uh, some of them are very high in terms of isolating parts of your activity from um, the need for a critical input or relocating your, your business activity or resource pooling. The negative numbers actually reflect cost savings. So conservation in terms of let's say energy efficiency more than pays for itself. It's doing the same with less input. Uh, management effectiveness is another productivity gain. So is technological change. So as far as uh, network uh, resilience contributions are concerned, um, 
there is great potential here for improvement. And I think Rick has touched upon some of these and uh, well on the way to, to a start on, on advancing the state of the art. So in terms of static resilience, uh, the ideal is to configure the system to balance protection and preparedness where preparedness is sort of what we call inherent resilience pre-positioning so that you're in good shape when you need to recover. And this has the effect of, could have the effect of minimizing the potential of the recovery effort. Uh, you can configure the system to balance protection and accessibility, which is important, especially in a case like COVID-19, uh, where your demand proximity to your, your customers is, has heightened importance. And again, you, you can do the study of the optimal pre Pre uh, preparedness, optimal stockpiling, and then the resource pooling tactic that I mentioned, which is instead of some central command or decreed government system of of uh, pooling or stockpiling, you have cooperative ventures between firms, and here you need to reconcile private motivations and the social optima in that case. Uh, in terms of dynamic resilience. You want to configure the system so as to be able to restore it as quickly as possible. And this could involve building in flexibility and modularity. And another thing carried over from uh, ecology is making the system uh, self reorganizing in the, in the process of, of restoration. So uh, combining these, several of these would be a major contribution that, that Rick has already talked about in his bi-level example. And if there's anyone that can advance the state of the art in this field, it's Rick Church. So thank you very much, everybody. Great, thank Happy you very much. Happy to take questions too. Yeah. Oh, I, I should oh. say at the end, I don't know if you're gonna post these, but there are some references to, to my work there. But, uh, you know, do you have some place to post Rick's presentation in mind, Jay Wan? Yeah, I think okay. I think it's going to be well. Jay Wan can speak. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah, we will we'll be able to share it, uh, his presentation upon approval, and also Adam, thank you, and okay. we'll share your slides as well. Okay, well, great. Great. So, great. So, so they will get publicity. That's great. Well, thank <laughs> okay. you very much, Adam. That was very very uh, appropriate. So let me. Yes. Um, organize the end of the time. So I'll let Rick respond for a few minutes. Then we have questions from the audience. And I hope that you have on your Zoom a little hand raising um, icon. So I would ask you to raise your hand. And uh, Jay Wan, could we then allow the video to go on to those people so they could ask their questions with video on or how will that work? Uh, we, I can make them to talk, make, make them talk, but you know, not with the video, just audio. Oh, okay, just talk, okay. Okay, I don't see the little raise hand thing on my screen, but I assume that the uh, participant, the uh, attendees do, is that correct? Okay, well, let's go on, uh, let Rick have a few comments and then I'll open up the floor for questions. Um, thank you, Alan, uh, Adam, for all of those nice, uh, and, uh, interesting intersections of my talk versus, uh, you know, a lot of the work, of the, I will say creative work at CREATE. Um, I, I clearly took a segment of, 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 uh, of thought and you rounded out a lot within the context of looking at, um, you know, and, and raising the issues of business interruption and a lot of other economic elements of, of of both whether we, are we really disruptable? Are we, uh, and given that disruption, are we, are we really resilient in how fast we bounce back and so forth? I think that it, I think that it's, um, um, this issue about self reorganizing that you mentioned at the end, uh, that's one of the things that is, that makes, um, the design problems of, we'll say, resilient or robust design, uh, because that in and of itself, the self-reorganization of what is left in a system to keep it operating, 
it makes uh, the problem at least a bi-level optimization problem in a design sense. But I, I think that um, we, should, we should always be looking um, at this dynamic issue of uh, what are the things that we can do um, to understand um, how we might reorganize after an event uh, to, to, um, to increase our um, capabilities of will responding to a disruption and, and reduce the, the, uh, the overall impact, especially in terms of lag. Um, because if something happens and it, it is disruptive for only a few days, that's one thing. But what if, what if Texas has uh, significant impacts for the next, uh, for this uh, recent uh, ice storm and so forth, significant impacts for the next uh, several years? What will that do for the economy? I mean, it's certainly gotta be a drain on the economy for all of the damage that, is, that, is, that has occurred. Um, so um, I think, I think um, we probably ought to be spinning more about the dynamics of the situation. And I, I um, would agree with you that that's a, a significant area. You've made some very good comments and, and covered the issues that CREATE has uh, provided. There are other centers that have focused um, more on certain issues like health security and so forth across the United States and, and uh, globally that there are some very interesting research centers, as I said before, the ETA Center uh, in Zurich on risk. Um, uh, some really fascinating work they're doing within the context of, of potential uh, uh, damage to banking systems um, and, and you know, whether, whether we can easily um, bounce back given some of the uh, some of the possibilities and how long that would take. Anyway, I, I uh, th this field is um, I think uh, something that, as I said before, my main objective of the talk was just to encourage people to think more about possible disruption and um, how we might uh, respond to that and especially within our work as regional scientists. Thanks. <clears throat> Thank you. Thanks. Thanks, Rick. Uh, Adam, you want to say anything else? Yeah, I, I just wanted to say one thing, and that is most of my presentations focused on the micro level, uh, but uh, uh, today, but uh, more than half of my research has actually been on the macro and regional macro impacts of, of disasters. Uh, the consequences of and resilience too. So resilience also has uh, general equilibrium multiplier effects uh, too that are, are worth studying. And in terms of dynamics, interestingly, one of our findings recently is that a lot of people define dynamic resilience in terms of shortening the period of recovery. It actually turns out that jumpstarting the recovery uh, kickstarting it, having more recovery earlier on actually contributes much more than does just uh, simply shortening the, the recovery period. Happy to open things up for questions. Okay, great. Uh, I know we have a question um, that's been going through the chat room. So let's have, oh, uh, we have called uh, Sandy Delarba to talk. Sandy, yeah, can you? Uh, yeah. Yeah, I can hear you just fine. Okay. So uh, Rick and Adam, thank you so much for your very nice presentations. I have a quick question for you, which is uh, how, wh what do you recommend to convince stakeholders to uh, fund some preemptive measures? In other words, before a disaster really affects a system. Quite often the strategy is to wait for the disaster to occur and then to act. So what could be, what can we do as scholars to convince stakeholders to consider some preemptive measures. Rick, go ahead, go ahead. Um, that's, a, that's a very good question. You know, um, I was, um, uh, four, seven or eight, nine years ago, I was at a Fortune 500 company headquarters. And uh, this was after the Long Beach um, 
San Pedro, well, the, the San Pedro, which is the ports of, of, Long Be uh, of Los Angeles and uh, Long Beach's port, um, they had a, a major strike and it disrupted the supply chains for a lot of firms. And in fact, there were a number of firms that, that had shortages in uh, open shelf space. Well, like as an example, Walmart had, had lots of open short, uh, shelf space for several weeks after this event and actually even for a month or more. And a lot of firms were, were impacted that, by that. And I, I asked them, because I came after the fact, I said, um, just what are you doing to help um, ameliorate this, this kind of impact? And they said, we relied so much on, on Long Beach and Los Angeles port terminals for all of our goods flows. And we don't do that anymore. And we've, you know, we're opening up supply chains elsewhere. It's costing us a little bit more, but what it amounts to is we can't afford to have that kind of disruption within the context of shelf space being empty. So um, it all, I think it all depends upon the circumstance, but, um, but even a back of the envelope analysis might be helpful to suggest that, look, if this happens, you could, you could be subject to a substantial um, uh, vulnerability in terms of, of uh, business interruption or whatever that might be. And you can protect yourselves if you're looking forward, you're thinking outside the box. Um, I think that um, that's, that's something we should be doing. No, I agree. Uh, if I can chime in, uh, one thing to, to emphasize is how low cost a lot of these resilience tactics are in terms of pre-positioning, uh, purchasing uh, a portable generator um, or setting up uh, alternative suppliers, maybe having some contingency clause where you're not actually utilizing them, but in a pinch you would. Uh, the other thing, I didn't make a distinction uh, that I've emphasized in a lot of my writings between what I call inherent resilience and adaptive. So a lot of resilience is there intrinsically for the taking, such as excess capacity or the ability to substitute inputs in, let's say, dual fired boiler between coal and gas. So they're very low cost. Conservation is very low cost. But um, a lot of the resilience tactics are adaptive, which means you don't actually have to uh, pre-position them or implement the, try to get them um, in place before the event, you just basically are able to react. And a good example is, is relocation. Um, and another one is import substitution, substituting imports from outside the region. And the good thing about those is that um, for any <clears throat> action you take beforehand, and this applies to all mitigation, and a couple of things like purchasing a, a generator ahead of time, uh, some inherent resilience, you really have to, to get the true benefit of that action. You really have to multiply it by a probability distribution of the occurrence of the event. So if the average occurrence of an event is one in 50 years, you could have a big benefit number, but you've got to multiply it by 0.02. And that reduces the benefits significantly. But if for the a lot of resilience tactics, one of their advantages is, again, you don't <clears throat> have to implement them until you know with perfect certainty the event has occurred, in which case you don't have to do that multiplication. And so the benefit is the benefit and it's, you know, keeps it keeps it fairly large. I might also add that every time a a damaging event occurs, we learn from that. And the Fukushima uh, earthquake tsunami uh, is a good example. Um, the power plant, the nuclear power plant in uh, Fukushima, perfect sure or whatever, uh, experienced uh, a partial meltdown because of the fact that um, they lost their controls on the system. 
And they lost their controls on the system because generators, you see, they had backup power, not from, you know, they were, they had a backup power supply, which was basically generators in their basement. But the tsunami flooded the power plant along with the basement, along with, so their, their backup generators didn't work. So they lost control on their uh, nuclear reactors. Now the same thing occurred, I can't remember, recall exactly which uh, hurricane this was, but in Houston, there were um, several, a uh, number of hospitals um, had, had some backup generators, but they were in basements and they were flooded and they lost their capabilities. And so some of these things are really kind of intuitive, right? I mean, natural kinds of things. Um, after the fact, it was duh, you know, we shouldn't have put our uh, generator in a place that could easily flood, we should put it in some place uh, elsewhere. Yeah, I think I know that was uh, uh, Tropical Storm Allison from a long time ago. But uh, okay. we have a couple more questions, so can I interrupt? Uh, I believe Sumi Lee wants to ask one, but uh, I think Jay Wan will ask on her behalf, and then Yifei. So oh, well, I... Oh, you have, oh, assume yeah, okay, yeah. Yes. <laughs> uh, just a simple question. So it, it sounds like the con concepts are pretty complex. And, uh, you know, when I look at the literature, then the capacity seems pretty difficult to operationalize. So like, my question is, okay, do we, don't we only know, you know, something is resilient only after the shock strikes and see if uh, you know that entity or unit is bouncing back quickly. Like, how do you really know or kind of measure um, so and so's resiliency before a shock strikes? And that's my question. It seems like we can only evaluate or know the resiliency or the capacity only after the shock happens? Well, there are some uh, hypotheses that you can consider, such as, you know, your ability to conserve gives you a direct productivity measure. But recently, uh, my colleagues and I have um, administered two surveys, one of Harvey victims, one of Superstorm Sandy, and and we've asked people, you know, what was the cost of implementing the resilience tactic? How much business interruption did you avoid? And we've come up with these pretty solid numbers that we are publishing. We've also developed a decision support tool called the Business Resilience Calculator, which uh, congeals all this information. So uh, if you've been hit by a disaster, it asks you to provide your data and on a real-time ongoing basis factors that in to change the numbers. And if you haven't experienced a disaster, it asks you to do a self-assessment as best you can, but then gives you numbers to compare for the median firm and the best practice firm in your region. So we've made a lot of empirical advances um, and, and that should help firms to know what other firms, businesses actually found in terms of implementing resilience tactics. And I think that's the best measure is actual experience at, rather than where I started with, you know, kind of the hypothetical uh, on the drawing board, theoretical gains that you'll get, because there are a lot of obstacles to implementing resilience to its full capacity. Okay, uh, thanks Adam. I think we have one more question. Uh, Ife, are you there? Can you unmute? Yeah, go ahead and ask your question. Um, uh, thank you. Um, um, uh, I think this, um, this, the talk is really uh, interesting and inspirational. I, I'm not the modern person. I used to do modern with P, but I'm not a modern person trying to, uh, right now I'm in the middle of mixed modeling and the qualitative approach. And uh, so I'm working in the economic sector. And then they're talking about like a evolution in economics, economic geography. They're also talking about the resilience, static, and the dynamic. <clears throat> what I'm trying to figure out, 
is some of the model you're talking about, you're talking about shocks before and after, and then demonstrate resilient and uh, personal or, or, or organizational or urban, urban, urban regional system radicalized. So I'm, I'm, my question to you, in cases, actually, sometimes um, organizations and the individuals or urban regions, they don't experience those shocks. They just die or decline gradually, or, it's, or just without any reason. You don't know what's the reason why they suddenly go off the chart. So I'm wondering, can you say anything about the cases and those kind of slow dying or, or you know, those were slow growing? And then we kind of in Chinese, they have a say, say it's like a warm water. You're putting the frog in the warm water and you don't feel it. Once you feel it, you're dead. So do you, can you say anything about the resilience in that case? Rick, I'll defer to you first. Well, so you're talking about resilience in a in something that's in decline, slow marginal decline. Is that what you're asking? Yeah, yeah, margin the gradual decline. That's right, that's gradual decline without that's, any major. That's, that's that's something that I um, I haven't really thought very much about, and and because because is this result of a disruption, or is this just result of of maybe the business environment, let's say it's a business um, that they're, um, they, haven't, they haven't changed with the environment. I think sometimes uh, clothing firms, they are big for a period of five or seven years, 10 years, and all of a sudden they go out of fashion and they, they sort of end up in slow decline. Yeah. Um, so um, I have a feeling that uh, in terms of that kind of organization, um, you have to have um, a good, good leadership and somebody that can really sort of feel the pulse of where they need to, uh, need to move. Mm -hmm. um, but within the context of other things, I'm, um, I don't know, it's, it's sort of like, uh, you know, um, when uh, the automobile came into existence, in the early 1900s, the buggy whip, um, let's see, uh, Hoover talked about buggy whips. Right. The buggy whip uh, companies slowly went into decline. And really, there wasn't anything they could do about it. Um, yeah. They would, you know, they'd have to suffer the fact that there would be fewer bubby, bu buggy whips in, uh, uh, in demand. Uh, so that I think there are several different kinds of circumstances, uh, some that you can't, you, you can't plan, a, you're just going to have to change what you're going to do. For instance, Nokia started uh, manufacturing rubber boots. That's what they were known for 100 and more years ago. Now, of course, it's cell phones. They certainly didn't see the difference. Be, I mean, they certainly... You know, transitioning from building, you know, manufacturing rubber boots to no, uh, to cell phones was quite a quite a leap. But but uh, that's where some successful firms have really seen. Um, even though that I suppose that the rubber boot demand never really increased much. <laughs> but it's, yeah. if you want to grow, you know, you've got to you've got to figure out where what other things you have to do. So you have to change. That's right. So, yeah. Just quickly, a lot of a lot of these things can be thought of as shocks, like the advent of the automobile or mining out a, a major deposit. Uh, classic paper on kind of the macro impacts of more general economic phenomena at the regional level is Martin and Sunley in the Journal of Economic Geography, 2015. I'd refer you to. Mm -hmm. Okay, that sounds great. I think uh, we've gone five minutes over because we had such a great presentation. Yeah. So can I kind of uh, I guess, make a ending comment. Let me thank so much Rick Church for your fantastic presidential address and Adam Rose for your complimentary and very informative discussion and all the attendees. I think this was a, a great session. And now I would like to welcome Rick Church as the 62nd president of the WRSA. And I guess say goodbye. So yeah, we'll say thank you. bye everybody. Thank you. I gotta go everybody, bye. Okay, bye. Bye. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, Rick.
Yeah. Thank you very much. Bye-bye.